Hi everybody that's joining. This is Love the Oceans live Q&A session. Um, this week we have Annabelle. I'm just gonna add Annabelle now. Annabelle is a, okay it's changed the way that Instagram works. Annabelle is a show lots of Snapchats today, um, which uh, some of you know. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey. Perfect. Um, I'm hoping that the internet holds up. Instagram seems to have updated, so I'm just navigating the new the new platform for, <laughs> for this. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, so just a heads up, I am talking to you from Mozambique, and sometimes the power goes out. So if my screen goes black, um, you'll still be able to hear me. <laughs> I'll just find <laughs> Okay. Out. I've got a head torch right here, so if the power goes up, then I'll just turn that on and we can continue, right. it's fine, the internet should be all right. Um, and then also if the internet drops out, then I'll just restart the live and then you can just rejoin. Okay. Um, so just, just a heads up. <laughs> all right, um, cool. Okay, cool. So do you want to introduce yourself for people that are tuning in at the moment um, and like your background and all the rest of it? Yeah, sure. I see my mom's here. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, I'm Annabelle. I am a first year master's student at the University of San Diego. I study shark and ray movement ecology. Um, right now, I'm working on looking at the movement and migration of shovelnose guitarfish and bat rays, which are both native to the California coast, um, and they are very common in San Diego. So, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm also the co-host of a podcast called LGBTQ Plus STEMcast. Um, we interview LGBTQ Plus identifying scientists from all over the world of different STEM fields. And yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, and then for people tuning in that might not know um, what Love the Oceans is and what we do. Um, so I'm Francesca. I'm the founder of Love the Oceans. So we're a marine conservation organization. Uh, working in Mozambique, um, hence the heads up around the internet, <laughs> um, and uh, we're working to establish a marine protected area here, so we do a lot of different areas of research, and or would normally do a lot of different areas of research and community outreach, uh, including fisheries research, humpback whales, coral reefs, ocean trash, and marine megafauna, um, and then we teach uh, basic marine resource management and swimming lessons as well. But COVID has obviously changed things quite dramatically this year, as it has for everyone. Um, so Mozambique's been in lockdown um, from March to October, and they're only just easing up now. And we're still not allowed like community gatherings and stuff like that. So um, but we had a real limit on the work that we could do. So we started these Q&A um, series to invite awesome guests on, like yourself, um, and talk about all things conservation and and marine related so um yeah it's great to have you on yeah um, i'm excited to be here for, thank you for people that are just joining now uh, if you have any questions for annabelle or, or myself then you can just drop them in the comments box down at the bottom and there's also a question box too um so feel free to drop them in throughout and we'll try and get to them as they come in but also we'll check at the end as well uh, but if you're cool with it, we've got loads of questions that have been pre-submitted, so we can just dive straight in, yeah? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. Perfect. Okay, so first question, um, we can ease into it. Uh, where does your interest uh, in shark and ray ecology come from? Yeah, it's actually kind of a funny story because um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do when I went into university. I had some, like, ideas of like maybe science maybe art I wasn't really sure um had lots of lots of interests um but then it came down to this high school English project that I had to do uh where we had to choose a career path and research it and really dive into what it meant and a lot of that involved going to um a place where people of that career field worked at and also interviewing someone um, of that career field. So I interviewed a shark ecologist um, who worked at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. 
um, and he studied shark behavior ecology. And it was so interesting uh, what he did. And I was like, I was hooked basically. And I was like, wow, this is really, really cool. So um, I found it really interesting that I didn't know that you could just study like specific parts of, um, of an animal's behavior like that and like focus in on a certain animal. Um, and so I was like, wow, studying sharks is really, really cool. <laughs> um, as most people do believe. And so I went, I ended up going to um, doing my undergraduate uh, university degree at University of San Diego. And um, there is a shark scientist there. His name is Dr. Andy Nozel, who is, he's now my master's advisor. He's awesome. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much how I really got into it. The more that I um, studied and learned about the oceans, the more I felt like I really belonged in the field. So it was really cool. So did you like sharks from a younger age or was that kind of like the initial like love developed when you were slightly older? Um, I think you cut out. Could you repeat that question again? Um, did, did you love sharks from like a younger age or was it just that like those kind of like events that, that created that love? Yeah, I was actually really into sea otters when I was little <laughs> and turtles. <laughs> I actually have a pet turtle and I was I oh, really so loved cool. going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium um, where they are known for their sea otters and stuff like that. So sharks was kind of a an abrupt turn for me, <laughs> <laughs> but um, now I'm obsessed with sharks. So, but yeah, I guess all my life I've been really interested in the ocean. It, it just took that interview for me to realize how interested I was in it. Yeah, yeah, and that you can do it for a career and all the rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that you are currently doing your masters, um, and your research at the moment. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about like your research background and also the project that you're working on right now? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned in my biography, in um, my undergraduate uh, research, I did, I worked with Dr. Nozel, and we were looking at, um, we were using drone technology to take videos of these leopard sharks that um, gather together every summer uh, in San Diego, and um, we were looking at how they, how their movement patterns were within those groups and how they moved between each other, their social behavior, stuff like that. It was this really cool project. And I was really looking forward to doing it for my master's. But unfortunately, I started the field research this summer. But unfortunately, uh, the drone fell into the ocean. And oh, no. we had to uh, seize the project due to time constraints. But that's totally fine. Because now I get to work on this really cool project looking at um, shovel nose guitar fish, which are these types of, uh, they're kind of like rays, I guess, but they are longer. Um, they kind of look like a kite, I would describe it as, I guess, um, and these bat rays. And basically what we're looking at is there's been a very noticeable, um, there's been a very noticeable movement pattern where these guitar fish and these rays will come to San Diego every summer. And it's um, thought that a lot of these individuals are pregnant female um, guitar fish and bat rays. And this kind of other sharks have been observed to come to San Diego uh, during the summertime too. And they're, and a lot of them are pregnant. And so what we think is that they're using the um, warmer, calmer waters of this kind of bay area to um, incubate their eggs, basically. The warmer waters help the, the, the babies and their tummies grow a lot faster in, in the summertime. And then they go either give birth there or somewhere else. We're not really sure. So that's kind of what my research will be looking at is where are these sharks going during or these rays going during different times of the year and why and what like influences their behavior to move from one place to another. 
That is so cool. With the drone work, is that in like really shallow? Is it like good biz then and quite shallow then to be able to do? Yeah, that? so it's really really cool because um, in San Diego you can actually snorkel with the leopard sharks really easily. They just uh, they they like to gather just right outside of the surf zone, so right where the waves break, um, and you can get really good drone footage of them. Um, if you ever so, choose to fly a drone over the water like that, yeah. I'm totally coming there <laughs> at some point because <laughs> that is super cool. We can get, like, our vis is, um, I would say, temperamental. Um, uh, and we can we have humpback whales here, so we can get, like, big stuff. So you can get, like, I don't know, your, your humpback whales, your manta rays, yeah, and... Uh, turtles and stuff and your whale sharks but we don't really get any drone shots of like normal sharks um ah uh, yeah <laughs> which uh yeah that that's that's so cool <laughs> yeah they really they really um like to gather in like pretty much waist deep water like i've seen people i mean people swim through the sharks all the time while we're taking footage and Sometimes people are just standing in that water. So it they really it's really quite cool to see how close they are to shore. It's kind of it's kind of funny. Um and in some in some point in some cases they're even in like knee deep water and their fins are sticking out of the water. It's it's really cute. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Oh my gosh, I think that sounds like my my shark heaven. <laughs> yeah. <That's> so cool. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. Uh, so someone actually asked uh, what your favorite species of shark is and why? Yeah, so uh, right now, at least, it would have to be the leopard shark because, I mean, it was the first shark that I got to study. And they're just really cute. And I've gotten to be in tanks with them and pet them, I guess, too, by in, since I was in the tank with them. Um, yeah, they're just so, they're really adorable sharks. If you don't know what they look like, you should definitely look them up and um, <laughs> and tell me if you also think they're cute. <laughs> Are you, like, what's the, do you know the Latin name of the species that you're talking about? Because I know that some people call leopard sharks, zebra sharks, some people call leopard sharks, leopard sharks. Like, there's zebra sharks and leopard sharks, and they have their, like, common names It's changed quite a lot, depending on what continent you're on. Um, do you remember the Latin name? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Triacus semifasciata, I want to say. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, the zebra shark in America, I guess, is the leopard shark in uh, Australia or something. Yeah, and it's really confusing. funny because, you know, yeah, because the zebra sharks actually kind of look like the American leopard sharks um, when they're babies which is why they have the name. Well, they also have the name leopard shark in Australia because they have these spots on their, on their bodies once they're. Oh, I think we frozen. Oh no. Oh, I can hear you again now. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yeah, your video is still kind of loading for me, but I can hear you too. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think we've got the same uh, where we are in Moz, like our zebra sharks, spots when they're older, stripes when they're younger. Um, yeah. They're still called zebra sharks. So I think it's just, yeah, it gets quite confusing. But then you've got, like, you've got your grey nurse sharks, which are called raggies in South Africa. Oh, interesting. And tigers elsewhere in the world and grey nurse sharks in other places so yeah common names get very confusing at times <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. yeah I don't think we have your species of um uh leopard sharks I'm getting confused uh, we don't have that species of um, leopard sharks here in Moles unfortunately um but that is like they're one of my bucket list species so I'm very jealous of your research <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um so someone has asked actually about your like journey into 
um, your career and what that looked like in terms of internships or volunteering when you were choosing like your um, path into ecology. You mentioned already that you did like a, um, a project at school that was like interviewing a professional. Um, did you also do like any internships or anything like that? Yeah, so um, at USD, we are required to do at least um, one research experience or internship. And so for me, I had tried to um, do the National Science Foundation's research for uh, research experiences for undergraduates, which is this amazing summer program that um, pays undergraduates to go work in um, a lab somewhere in the US uh, and a bunch of labs around America do participate in this program. So I had tried to apply for that, but I didn't get in. Um, so that's how I ended up working with Dr. Nozel uh, for, for summer. Uh, and we did the drone stuff with the leopard sharks. And then we also got on a boat and um, fished for uh, fished and ran ultrasounds on leopard sharks and uh, soup fin sharks, which um, are called a couple of different things in around the world. They're also called school sharks. Um, I forget the other names for them, but yeah. So I was helping him with his research with uh, that looked at kind of So that? You there? Yeah, I'm here. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm here. I can hear you. Again. Sorry, did you I? You were just saying. Okay. I just noticed that my yeah. Wi-Fi had cut out too for, for a hot minute there. Um, yeah, so. Good. So, yeah, we were, I was helping him run ultrasounds on these uh, soup fin sharks because we were checking to see like I said if those were preg those sharks were pregnant too because they would because um, that would kind of confirm that this place was uh, supported just more than just pregnant female leopard sharks but also other types of sharks too um, and so that was really cool I got to look at the um, shark embryos um, on an ultrasound which on off a boat which was really really cool um but yeah other than that i got a lot of class experience um usd is kind of a smaller school so we had a lot of opportunities to uh go on field trips and do lab experiments and lab projects in class and um, i ended up spinning one of those lab projects into my own research project which i went and uh, presented at a couple of conferences um at with that project looking at um, looking at uh, these muscles um, as in the like clam muscles um, in looking at their burrowing behavior and how they um, and how they select their habitat in terms of like uh, coarser grain sand or finer sand so that was that was really cool too because I got to I got to travel um, to these conferences and present and yeah that was pretty much my undergraduate degree uh, career in a nutshell yeah that's pretty cool yeah it's all about experience isn't it um, and I think ultrasounding pregnant sharks on a boat is uh pretty out there <laughs> yeah in terms of shark research experience that's pretty cool yeah definitely um, wasn't something I was expecting to do because I do get really seasick on boats so I was kind of apprehensive on about going on a <laughs> boat um but it ended up working out I took um uh, took some Dramamine and just stuck it out first couple times though I did end up uh hurling and I got to watch as a bat ray my puke but <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's good uh it's good bait right <laughs> yeah definitely definitely chump the waters for sure yeah <laughs> nice. 
uh, I'm just get I'm beginning to get seasick now, which really sucks. I uh, went through oh, no. the other day and was really seasick, and it was like a flat day. It's so weird. I think, and then I talked to my friends. They were like, "Oh yeah, that's just getting older," and I was like, "Well, that's depressing." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully it won't get worse. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've just developed seasickness, so that is something I'm now getting familiar with. Um, hopefully, it's something that I'll be able to avoid by taking seasickness medication. But we'll see. <laughs> um, okay, cool. The next question is quite long, so I'm just going to read it. Um, okay. Because it was it was quite a lengthy one. Um, the price of acceptance often comes at the cost of one's own authenticity, and there is an obvious issue with the recruitment and retention of LGBTQ plus individuals in STEM fields. Do you think your desire to be true to yourself was even more overwritten by the uh, conceived need to assimilate into the norm in the STEM, in the STEM space in particular? Mm. Okay, so yeah, this is a really good question. Um, I have never compromised being who I am for pretty much anything in the world. I feel like my identity is very important to me. And um, whether that be my racial identity, my sexual identity, whatever. And um, I think that I've been taught from my parents, from my mentors, that I should never have to compromise who I am as a person to get something that I want. Um, so I've never felt the need to. Again, though, I've been extremely lucky to end up where I am. My department has been more than supportive towards me, both as an academic and as a person. So I'm very fortunate to have that support group behind me um, in my in my career advancement um, and my advisor is just the best. He has supported me since day one. Um, so yeah, I, at least in terms of my experience, I don't feel like I've had to ever sacrifice my authentic self to be where I want to be right now. That's really cool. Um, okay, and then someone has also asked, uh, how can, uh, this is, I think this was the same person actually that asked it, um, how can allies help enable people of any gender identity to live with authenticity? Yeah, so ally work is obviously really important. Um, a lot of what, like, at least the LGBTQ plus community um, did and has done couldn't have been done without the support of the um of allies and such although a lot of our work has been done within our community is like incredibly lgbtq plus led and um driven um what i would recommend at least coming from what i have um experienced and seen is that educating yourself about um issues is a really important aspect of supporting any gender minority or any person of any gender. Um, there are a lot of really good online resources. Google is your best friend. Um, and yeah, I think that that's always a great first step to like getting to understand the issues um, that different minority groups face. And also just, um, just educating yourself on your own privilege that you hold as a person too um, is really important because I feel like in order to understand those around you, you also need to understand how you interact or how your identity interacts with everyone else's identities. So um, yeah, that would be a, a good first step. And also just getting involved in different um, activist organizations. I know that social media has been a really great help for me to at least to get um, involved in different projects and movements and just get myself um, out there and helping other communities and such. So yeah. Yeah, 
yeah definitely um i think like the the checking your own privilege obviously the education piece is so important and then the checking your privilege is so important as well um like even just the other day i was reading like this um like it was it was almost like a it was like a if this statement applies to you like list of things um where mm-hmm. you could like recognize your privilege kind of thing um and it was about like members of the lgbtq plus community versus um like your your like cisgender cisgender uh, straight people and the privilege that people hold and um i was reading it and like i tried to put myself in my my friends and my family's um shoes who identify within the lgbtq plus space and even then like even though I consider myself an ally and I, and I do try and like educate, educate myself as much as possible and help where possible. Um, it's still so important to like check back and keep in touch with it all. Cause like even reading that checklist, I was like, yeah, that is crazy. Like the level of privilege involved, um, uh, that I hold. Um, so it's just, yeah, so important to check that stuff. Um, so I hope anyone listening, um, <laughs> heard what you said and uh takes action accordingly um yeah but yeah um okay so uh, i think we're kind of continuing along this vein for a little bit um so someone actually asked what would have made your professional journey um a little bit better yeah i think that um i wish that i had taken more research opportunities quite honestly like um i didn't quite realize my my broader career path I guess or what I wanted to do post-college I didn't realize that I wanted to go into research and academia until quite late and in my undergrad career so I really wish that I had taken advantage of all the connections that we have um, within our department and also at USD um, and uh, done more stuff (laughs) <laughs> but I guess everyone has that kind of retrospective. Oh, I, I really wish I did more stuff, but, you know, I ended up where I am now. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here, you know? <laughs> yeah. People always ask like advice and stuff. And I'm always like taking opportunities. Cause like now, for instance, like I'm exactly the same. I look back at my time at uni and there was um, like an extracurricular shark tagging program which I really should have done and to be honest I'm not really sure why I didn't do it like you know life so something will have been going on which meant that I couldn't do it or whatever or, um and now like we like one of our partners um tag sharks with the oceanographic research institute in South Africa and now I'm like damn why didn't I have that like if I'd done that and had that training like while I was at uni I would already have the skill set and I wouldn't need to train in that particular area right now. Um, but I guess it's, it's hindsight, isn't it? You always look like you. Like, yeah. Should have, taken, should have taken more opportunities, but, you know, we are where we are. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then have you faced any major challenges? I know you're still early career, but have you faced um, any major challenges in your path to where you are now? Um, I feel like I've been mostly sheltered by my department so far. I mean, since I've, I did my undergrad at at USD and I'm now doing my master's at USD, there isn't, there hasn't really been much of a change. Um, the only real experience I've had outside of researching with my department is, or interacting with people in my field outside of my department is at conferences. And that's been a pretty pretty fine experience. Um, I know that there are pockets of, of spaces where aren't, where there isn't as inclusive people who aren't as inclusive, but there's also pockets of people where it's really inclusive. So I think I've been lucky enough to, uh, take the, take the more, um, not easy route, but like one that is most, um, uh, say for my identity and um, my my and aligns with my beliefs the most. Yeah, 
You actually mentioned in your bio that you'll be that you want to do a PhD. Do you think that will be at um, San Diego as well, or do you think you'll move to a different uni for that? Or do you know? Um, yeah, so Still early days. I, I think, like I said, I did the drone work with uh, uh, in San Diego, um, and I'm hoping to actually pick that project up again once I finish my master's. And I think. Um, Right now, it looks like maybe I'll end up in Washington doing that um, at the University of Washington, but it's still really up in the air. Um, it really depends on what kind of funding I get and um, where this next year takes me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Exciting times, though. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, what elements in the STEM industry have you found or do you think are the biggest boundaries or most scary for LGBTQ plus people um, or gender non-conforming people? Yeah, so um, I actually talk about this a lot on my podcast with a couple of different interviewees, but traveling is a huge um, roadblock for a lot of LGBTQ plus folks. Um, field work, especially where you're in remote areas, it can be a little intimidating, but also conferences where, you know, um, a conference might be in a place that where being LGBTQ plus is illegal, where it's like you can get imprisoned for it, or it's stuff like that, or even where racism is really rampant, stuff like that. Um, even within the US, I feel like there's a lot of fear around traveling and being in an unfamiliar space where you're not really sure how to um how you should present because it's um you don't really know the the mindset of the people there um so that's kind of the biggest roadblock for me that I've experienced at least. I think also um, there are a lot of people in positions of power, such as like principal investigators, administrations, stuff like that, where um, they aren't as inclusive because, I mean, not to stereotype, but they're old white men most times and that, uh, and they have obviously very different beliefs from uh, from people who ha are just joining the field, um, and so that can also be that can also be a huge roadblock for getting opportunities and and uh, doing research at a university that you really really like. Sometimes it can create a really toxic lab experience or space for for people. So. Um, those are two of the kind of biggest things that I've heard um, talking with people. Yeah. Um, and uh, have you have you found the? I know that you said that you've worked a lot within um, San Diego itself, and you felt like a little bit sheltered um, by um, USD. But uh, someone actually asked, have you found the environmental and ocean sciences field to be an inclusive one? Yeah, for the most part, yes. I'm very active on Twitter, so I've made a lot of um, friends within the science community who have, uh, who are, who are either allies or LGBTQ plus identifying or people of color. Um, so I, at least early career scientists are, um, who are on Twitter are really, really supportive and really willing to learn and, uh, are making huge efforts to make environmental and ocean sciences a more diverse, inclusive space. Um, I'm part of an organization called MIS, which is Minorities in Shark Sciences, um, that focuses on uh, the diversity and inclusion of women in color in in shark science shark sciences and so that has been a really awesome community that I've gotten to be a part of since its conception um, this past summer and so yeah I feel like at least where I'm at right now um, 
pretty inclusive. I know that maybe once I get into more, get deeper into academia and research and stuff, maybe I will encounter a few roadblocks here and there, but I do know that I have a huge community behind my back that's just cheering me on. Yeah, I think it's mixed, isn't it? I think within every industry, you're going to get people that are not... How do I say this? You're going to get people that are assholes in every industry, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah, you, you like you're going to get the you're going to get like the like the nice allies and everyone, and, but you do unfortunately get some um, not great people. Um, but that's in that's in every industry. So um, yeah, it's just about navigating around that, I guess. And, and being aware of, of different you know, groups that might not um, be as welcoming. Um, but uh, you mentioned actually that you, you mentioned earlier that you do um, an LGBTQ podcast. Do you want to just talk a little bit more about that and um, why you do it and like what that involves um, and also where people can listen to it? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, like I said before, um, I co-host a podcast. It's called LGBTQ plus STEMcast. Um, the socials for that are on Twitter and Instagram are at LGBTQ S-T-E-M-C-A-S-T. Um, and we, I actually was going to be an interviewee on the show originally, but the founder um, is an undergraduate at and goes to school in Puerto Rico and I offered my help to him as he was just starting this um, over the summer and we ended up uh, getting along really well and we ended up being co-hosts together so uh, I release episodes every other week Um, he releases episodes every other week as well but we alternate I guess so episodes every Monday Um, (laughs) and we interview pretty much anyone who wants to be on our show um, who identifies as an LGBTQ plus uh, person in the STEM field. And um, yeah, it's amazing how many people are out there. We have had like so many people interested in being on our show um, to the point where we can't even keep up. (laughs) And it's, I think that one of the main goals for me as a host, I just want to be able to diversify what being in STEM looks like um, and what it means to be in STEM and also foster that community for, for LGBTQ plus folks who might feel isolated um, in their career and even provide like, a place for prospective people, um, whether no matter what age, I guess, um, wherever they are in their career, to be able to listen to this podcast and be like, oh, there are people who look like me in STEM. There are people who identify like me who are in STEM and they're in, they're all over. And, and so that's been one of the most rewarding parts of my, of my journey as a host um, is that I have been able to connect with so many different people from all around the world and just talk to them and like get to know them and find things in common with them. I've learned so much about different different STEM fields. Um, one of my favorite episodes um, is about space and and studying space I I absolutely love interviewing people who study space because I am so (laughs) afraid of space and I don't know anything about space so I'm just like tell me all about space um that was actually my next question I was gonna ask you if you tend to like lean towards the marine science side or whether you try and like you know interview everyone across the board with STEM just personally because obviously your background is marine science um but yeah space that's cool (laughs) yeah I've actually only interviewed maybe two uh, marine scientists now, I think, um, whose episodes haven't been released yet. But yeah, I haven't really been um, biased about who I interview. It's more like I just want to make sure that I 
get a smattering of everyone pretty much because everything is so interesting. What it's really it's really amazing to see people light up about when they or light up their eyes like light up when you when you ask them to talk about their field and they just can go on forever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just love seeing the passion on their faces as they talk about something that they really really enjoy. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um okay. Um, and then what does the next five years look like for you? Well, hopefully, if all goes well, I'll get my master's. And <laughs> five years from now, I'll be in the middle of a PhD, maybe finishing a PhD. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's pretty much that's what the, the next five years looks like for me. Well, that's pretty exciting. I've just been looking at PhDs myself at the moment. Um, and getting all excited about it so yeah totally feel yeah that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> um and then the last question is just about advice for like youngsters looking to get into the field um have you got any advice for um young people that might be looking to get into um shark and ray ecology or you know something similar um yeah any advice for them yeah um like i said just take any opportunity that you're that you get um it doesn't matter it doesn't really matter if it's specific to sharks or rays or fish or whatever it can be really anything um like i said i started out my my kind of professional um research uh studying studying mussels and now i'm studying sharks so things can change really fast um if you want them to. Um, also, I, from what I've learned, I know that people get a lot of like really nervous emailing or contacting scientists or older people in general. <laughs> I know that I still get really nervous. I have to like calm my nerves for like a good five minutes before sending an email. Um, I have learned though that most, for the most part, people are really friendly and love answering questions about their careers. Um, as I've said on the podcast, like, or as I've said about the podcast, people really just like are very passionate in their field, you know? So um, they always want to talk about themselves um, in a good <laughs> way. <laughs> so don't be afraid to reach out. Even if it's like one of the biggest people in the field, just, just do it, you know? It turns out that the guy that I interviewed for my high school project was one of the biggest great white shark uh, behavioral ecologists um, in the field. So, and I had no idea. I was just like, I'm just going to email this guy because he works by my house in the Bay Area. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, little did I know that that was um, that was a big big name in the field. So, you know, just take risks and don't be afraid to. To yeah definitely and, and everyone's then, yeah. so so reachable these days as well especially yeah. with like social media and stuff like everyone yeah I feel away. like everyone has social media nowadays or at least the the younger portion of the STEM field like I said Twitter is a great place to connect with with scientists there's tons of tons of researchers uh people in the industry grad students all on science Twitter and they are they're just so cool. They're, they're amazing. So yeah. And of course, I'm always here. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, okay, cool. Uh, we have our quick fire questions, which we'll go through. But if people have questions, I know we've got one um, that we'll try and get to at the end. If people have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments box while we do quick fire questions. Um, but these are just fun, kind of unrelated questions um, that we do with all of our interviewees um just to get to know you a little bit better um so if you're ready should we jump in yeah let's do it yeah, perfect um okay favorite ocean creature sharks <laughs> that was easy <laughs> i i agree that was a good that was a good answer <laughs> um favorite day of the week uh thursdays i guess <laughs> nice um, plastic free or eco products that you can't live without? Um, hmm. 
my hydro flask. I don't think I've used a plastic water bottle in quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. It saves so much, eh? It saves money as well, you know? Yeah. So. Um, favorite beach in the world? Favorite beach? Probably the the La Jolla beach in, uh, in San Diego where all the leopard sharks are. It's a nice beach. Right, you are the second person on our Q&A series that has said that exact beach. So that is <laughs> 100% going on my bucket list now. Uh, right. Especially having learned about all the sharks there, I am 100% there when travel is, <laughs> when travel is allowed again. Um, last song you listened to? Last song that I listened to, ooh, I want to say it was probably like it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. The Michael Bublé cover. <laughs> Been listening it's to a lot November. of Christmas. You're listening to that already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're a Chris. You're a Christmas fan then. Big yeah. into Christmas. <laughs> um. Okay, dolphins or sharks? Sharks. <laughs> Is that even a question? That was easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, favorite holiday? Favorite holiday? I would have to probably say Christmas, just because I don't really, not really into any. Oh, you're already holidays. listening to Christmas <laughs> songs, so. <laughs> um, would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to speak to animals? Ooh, probably speak every language in the world. I really admire people who are able to speak more than one language so yeah yeah definitely me too um my my bilingual skills are seriously lacking and i'm really trying to work on it but <laughs> um as a superpower teleportation or breathing underwater oh hmm probably teleportation and I can just teleport underwater for like a few seconds and then teleport back up onto like land for a few seconds and breathe. <laughs> I feel like that's cheating, but we'll let it go. <laughs> um, what book would you take with you onto a desert island? Ooh, book. Uh, huh, not really a big reader. <laughs> uh, probably Scientific like journals? <laughs> Oh no, that would that would bore me to death. <laughs> um, let's see. The last book that I read that I really like is probably Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. It's a graphic novel about her coming out story, so probably Fun Home. Cool. Um, first thing you're gonna do when things get back to normal? <laughs> uh, hopefully go back down to San Diego and hang out with the sharks there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I go back to school because, you know, I'm back home in the Bay right now. So hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get back to it. Uh, and last question. Why do you love the oceans? Oh, gosh. I love the ocean because um, I mean, so many things. It's so, so beautiful. And I think there's just so much, so much mystery surrounding it. But like, I, you just don't know what's what you'll find and I think that's really fascinating and you know I'm also getting paid to study it so <laughs> <laughs> yeah win-win situation <laughs> okay cool um we're getting some love for fun home in um and I'm just going to scroll back so we can get a question at the back um, someone asked, um, what could research bases do to ensure an inclusive and welcoming environment for LGBTQ plus students and early career scientists? Yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of signal that you're a safe space. Like, I don't know, um, you could easily put up, I know that I kind of see safe space I kind of know to myself that safe spaces are safe spaces when they have like either resources about inclusivity in terms of like sexuality or gender and or like little pride flags everywhere stuff like that um little things like that but in terms of like kind of institutional 
Um, changes that you can make. I mean, there's tons of trainings that you can take. I probably um, lots of online resources um, will, can tell you probably more than I can what is useful and what isn't useful for <laughs> inclus inclusive spaces. But yeah, I I think the first step is making it feel and look like an inclusive space. So um, yeah. little signals or um, like, yeah, just little, little things like maybe uh, pronouns and on your website, stuff like that um, is a really good signal to um, more inclusive spaces. Um, okay, cool. Uh, do you have any, before we wrap up, we've got a few minutes left. Um, do you have any projects that you want to talk about um, or any upcoming things that you want people to look out for uh, and where can they find them? Yeah, so like I said, the podcast, uh, you can find it at LGBTQ STEMcast on Instagram and Twitter. We are... Uh, our podcast gets distributed on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on Anchor.fm, so be sure to check that out. Um, we are currently doing a queer science history series on our social medias where we, um, every week we talk about a new, uh, a, a historical queer science figure that's kind of been, uh, who's has kind of been um, erased from history, so we're trying to we're trying to educate people about that right now. Um, those are little infographics on our social media. Um, but yeah, in terms of the podcast, we don't really have any upcoming projects coming up, but it's really uh, fun to listen to. Uh, and yeah, in terms of myself, um, I don't think I'm doing anything in the near future, but if you, you can follow me on Twitter at Annabelle Gong. It's just my name or on Instagram here, um, and you can get all the updates about me uh, and what I'm doing. I tend to do a lot of LGBTQ plus outreach, shark outreach with um, minorities in shark sciences. Um, yeah, oh, also, yeah, a little plug for, for Miss as well. You can follow them at M-I-S-S -S underscore Elasmo, like Elasmo Brink, as in sharks and rays. Um, they're on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Um, they do a bunch of really cool uh, outreach events for everyone of all ages. Um, they're super awesome and they're full of really amazing women of color in, in shark sciences. So that's definitely a great place to start if you're looking to follow more shark science scientists um, and diversify your feed at the same time. And they've been growing really quick, hey? Like, they, they're they quite new. Um, like, the actual uh, organization is quite new to the space, right? And um, they've been growing quite quickly because they came on our radar a few months ago. But they've, they've been, like, really active and got, like, lifted up pretty quick. Yeah, they started in, like, August. And they yeah. had raised, like, $25,000 for next summer's or next spring or something to provide um, women of color um, who were just starting in shark scientists, like different field, I think it's like field research opportunities um, in Florida. Mm -hmm. So that is, that was really, really cool. I, it's so yeah. amazing to see how fast they've grown and to be a part of it. It's, it's been really awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, yeah. And anyone tuning in at the moment, you can click, um, I think it's your top. Uh, corner and you can see Annabelle's profile give her a follow and you can see us as well and follow us if you're not uh, following us um and yeah this session will also be available on our IGTV immediately after this so if you're just tuning in now and you missed some of the conversation earlier um then please do catch it on our IGTV um and this will also be cross-posted onto our YouTube later this week and we will put that on our Instagram when it's on our YouTube as well um so there are plenty of spaces to watch this um so if you want to check back then please do um but thank you so much for joining us tonight uh it was lovely talking to you um and if you ever want to come to mozambique please uh drop us wine and we'll be more than happy to have you here oh and you don't have you to are. ask me twice that sounds like so much fun. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's not too bad. We can show you our slightly murkier waters than uh, San Diego, <laughs> but uh, we can show you our little whale sharks and humpback whales. <laughs> I'm sure, it's warmer though. San Diego water is freezing. So. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> it's toasty, especially at the moment. Today was a particularly hot day, but it's just getting to that point where it's kind of uncomfortable hot. Not that I'm moaning. I'm not moaning at all. <laughs> Obviously, I'm very grateful that it's warm at the moment. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, but yeah, you're more than welcome to come anytime. Um, so it was lovely chatting to you. Um, have a great day. And yeah, if anyone's got any questions, um, then feel free to either um, you can probably just message us and we'll forward them to Annabelle if you're all right with that. Yeah, totally. Um, or yeah. my DMs are open too, so yeah. feel free to yeah just um, ask away. So. Awesome. Cool. Uh, have a great right. afternoon and thank you very much for joining. Thanks for having me. Ciao. Bye.